Welcome to Rising Stars, where Miriam Knight, publisher of New Consciousness Review, interviews exciting new voices in the world of progressive and transformational books, films, and ideas who offer intriguing perspectives on life, the universe, and everything in between. Join us as we celebrate the conscious awakening and explore many expressions of consciousness in action. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Miriam Knight, the publisher of New Consciousness Review. And here on the Rising Stars show, I will be introducing you to two or three of these authors each show, especially those who might not have had as many opportunities to be heard, but who offer intriguing information and inspiration. As you listen to our guests, I hope you'll find some food for thought and learn a little more about who we are and all we can become. Now, my first guest today is Jerry Lane. Jerry is a retired carpenter and a foreman supervisor who earned a master's degree in creative writing from San Francisco State University. During the Vietnam War, he served as a platoon commander for the U.S. Marines. Jerry has transmitted several hundred lessons from beings known as Christ Michael and Mother Spirit over many years. Their best lessons are collected in his books, Adventure of Being Human. It's a series that includes uh, his first book that covers the lessons that he received from both Christ Michael and Mother Spirit. And then his current book is called The Adventure of Being Human, Mother Spirit Speaks, that just came out this year from Origin Press. It provides a selection of another set of these transmissions exclusively from Mother Spirit. Now, Jeffrey, J Jerry is a longtime student of the Urantia book, as well as a student of Zen teachings. And I'm very pleased to welcome him. Welcome, Jerry. Well, glad to be here, Miriam. Jerry, um, this is interesting that you have these two sort of covalent entities, Christ Michael and the Divine Mother or Mother Spirit. How do you conceive of this Mother Spirit? Well, following, uh, as you said, I was a student of the Urantia book, and it teaches and she confirms that she is a direct daughter of the infinite spirit. So it's, it's uh, she's like our mother's spirit for this whole part of the galaxy, <laughs> you might say. Uh, she's a mother's spirit for over almost close to 4 million inhabited worlds like ours. So the Urantia cosmology is very, very vast. It corresponds to all of our recent discoveries of, you know, of the universe. And so Mother Spirit is this uh, creator, uh, daughter of the infinite spirit. And she's actually, the other great thing about Mother Spirit, she's actually part of us. She's part of our mentality, if you will. And so uh, we're more, uh, as she says, we're more than just a super intelligent animal. We actually have this whole spirit dimension with part of us. And then in a sense, she's part of that. She gives us a little boost inside so that's uh, that's who and what she is and, and what she does for us. Well, so what is the division of labor between uh, the the divine feminine or, or the mother spirit and um, the the Michael figure? Right, uh, they're very much equals. Uh, Michael is a uh, is a creator son of both a God the a Father, God the Son, the first two personalities of deity. Then Mother Spirit is part of, uh, is a daughter of the Infinite Spirit. So, Michael so she kind of completes the Trinity. Uh, a, a kind of a Father Spirit, and Mother Spirit is is the female aspect. And and since she's behind all of the female uh, aspects of deity that all the world religions have had forever. Well, it's interesting that um, the the two tend to complement each other. So. Um, reading your book, I, I get the feeling that the male side, the Michael side, is more concerned with uh, order and <clears throat> progression of evolution and so on, whereas the, the, the mother spirit 
seems to me to be more, you, you said in the book that she's in charge of creating angels and creating, you know, the material form here. Yes, she's very much the, uh, uh, the origin of life on our planet and a number of other planets. So life as we know it, uh, our physical form comes very directly from her. And as, as you noted, she's also the, the mother of a whole host of celestial personalities. And again, this is something that uh, within the Urantia book, there's several chapters on her, hundreds of pages. And for myself personally, I've been transmitting her for over 10 years. And there is a website called TM Archives, the teaching mission. I'm part of that. And the archives has over about 100, uh, 150 uh, to 200 of the lessons that I've transmitted. And also, if your listeners want to go to TM Archives, they can actually hear me transmitting her. There's a lot of audio files there, about 100 or so. They can actually hear me just personally transmitting Mother Spirit. Well, I'm curious, Jerry, you, you say that you're a retired carpenter and you were in the military and uh, now you're um, focusing on your writing. How did you begin to transmit uh, these celestial beings? Well, I was a student of the Urantia book for about 40 years or so. And then uh, about, oh, 18, 20 years ago, our, our little study group all over the world, there's just study groups of the Urantia book. We heard that some in some of these Urantia study groups, people were receiving messages from, you know, from the spiritual beings. And so uh, we invited someone to uh, come out from St. Louis called Donna D'Angelo. She has her own website called uh, Center for Christ Consciousness. And I literally sat right by her side almost every week for two, four years. And she kept telling all of us that anybody could do this. Just uh, I'll tell your listeners, anybody can do this kind of transmitting if they just tune in to this mother spirit right within them. And so... Uh, Donna gave me some personal lessons, and all of a sudden she she was leaving to go over to Oakland, and I had inherited her group. And so all of a sudden, I'm sitting there with like six or eight people around me, and I just started uh, transmitting. And so from the very beginning, I started transmitting both Michael and Mother Spirit, like every other week or so. And like I say, it's built up to about between the two of them, almost uh, 300, 350 of these transmissions now. And your uh, the information that you bring through, is it like an expansion or, or an elaboration on the material in the Urantia books? Book? It's, very, it's very much an elaboration, and it's uh, a much more personal thing. Another thing I should mention, Miriam, is that these sessions usually last about an hour, and Michael and Mother Spirit will give a half an hour talk, a lesson, and then the rest of it is questions and answers. So I'll tease your listeners with the idea that if you had a question to ask Mother Spirit, what would that be? What is it that you don't, you really don't know? You know you're not going to play games here, but you don't know, but you would really love to know and have this opportunity to ask her. So I'm envisioning maybe the third book of this series that comes out, this The Adventure of Being Human, will be just that, all these answers that she's given to questions that have come up over the years. Well, I have a question that you can transmit the next time you're in contact. I was reading your book, and <clears throat> aside from Mother Spirit herself, every other figure in the book is male. How come? Well, that's the first book you're talking about. Uh, the first book, The Adventure of Being Human. <coughs> Excuse me. In this very first uh, book, we put it was by the equal, Michael and her. Now, the second book that I'm uh, talking about today, The Adventure of Being Human Part 2, is exclusively Mother Spirit because we felt that with Michael, Christ Michael, there's been so much <laughs> written about him the last 2,000 years since he was here as Jesus. We would devote an entire book just to Mother Spirit. So uh, in this second book, The uh, Adventure of Being Human 2, is strictly Mother Spirit. Yes, I uh, I appreciate that. But um, when you look 
through the the transmissions, and then you look at the uh, you have a very helpful uh, appendix with an explanation of all the different personalities, um, and you talk about the sort of hierarchy of administration going back to the very central core of paradise and and working out into the various uh, universes and super universes and sub universes and so on. But everybody that you mention in terms of administrative um, uh, task is male. That is what I was getting at. Oh, yes, Miriam, that's a very important point because uh, it's not just feminists, but a lot of, a lot of people wonder about that. Uh, both Michael and Mother Spirit and uh, all of these transmissions, the Arantia book itself says these is just a convention. In other words, of both Michael and Mother Spirit, where you have a, a, a kind of a male and female personality, above them, it's not differentiated by sex at all. In other words, they talk about God the Father or the Eternal Son of Paradise. This is strictly a convention because obviously God is the origin of both. God's the origin of everything. And so it isn't until you get down to our own local universe of about four million planets or so, that's the first time you have a differentiation of both male and female. And there was all the entities above them are not sexual. They're just uh, referring them to in, in a male pronoun, pronoun is just a convention. They want to make that very clear that there's no sexism involved here. Uh, <laughs> that That's a big thing they teach against is the total equality of the sexes. There's even a part in the Urantia book about there actually was an Adam and an Eve <laughs> on the planet about 40,000 years ago. Another great love story if your listeners want to get into it. And how shocking it was for the primitive people of that time to see both as equal male and female. Well, I'm very relieved to hear that, Jerry. And we're going to uh, take a quick break now and stay with us because we'll be right back with Jerry Lane, the transmitter of the adventure of being human. Expand your soul. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Radio Namaste leads you down the yellow brick road into portals of consciousness with the blue collar goddess as your host. Interviews with humans who could be famous or just popular and answers to everything are on the agenda. Tune into Om Times Radio and drop in on Thursdays at 3 Eastern. It's a different brand of enlightenment. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Om Times Media one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Hi, this is Angela Levesque, host of Entanglement Radio. Join me Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern for inspiring conversations with visionaries in spiritual science and conscious healing. Entanglement Radio, Wednesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern. Transcendent Talk for the Conscious Mind. Bringing you the best of the conscious minds in the world. Om Times Radio, your conscious lifestyle on steroids. And we are back speaking with Jerry Lane, the author or the, the, the vehicle for the Adventure of Being Human, book two, Mother Spirit Speaks. Now, Jerry, before the break, we were um, reassuring our listeners that the use of the male um, figures of speech uh, was merely a convention. Um, now, I want to get into the actual content of the messages in this book, because as I was reading them, I was really um, inspired by them. One of the main uh, uh, or important 
uh, qualities that Mother Spirit urges us to cultivate, both in ourselves and in our children, is curiosity. Now, why is that, Jerry? Well, their whole notion is that truth itself, you might say with a capital T, is an encompassing. It's, it's, it's what surrounds all of us. And the only way to approach this is with a great amount of humility. And they say humility is the exact opposite of being humiliated. It's a spiritual quality of being aware of something enormous. Like you're sitting at the on the on the beach, you're aware of the whole ocean out there. You can feel tiny and humiliated, or you can be thankful that you're in touch with something so enormous. This is the essence of curiosity, of just being very open-minded, with a wonderful feeling of humility, of having this in touch with this enormous, enormous universe and all these millions of people all around us. And this is where, they, as they promise, a kind of eternal life that is not a repetition. It would be a hell of boredom. But the fact that the universe is not repeating itself. And the only way to approach it is with this kind of curiosity, a, a hunger to go out and embrace it and, and, and feel it and, and experience it. So that's that's the they talk about the uh, this wonderful partnership of curiosity and courage, because it takes nerve. It takes nerve to feel humble that you only have a very small grasp of things so far, and yet you have a whole eternity to go out there and keep exploring. Uh, that's the essence of curiosity. It's a, it's a blessing. I loved that combination of courage and curiosity. And if I understood correctly from the book, we are, uh, we humans are one of the vehicles through which um, the universe expands, God expands, or God evolves. It's like there's a co evolution where we are partners with the divinity. Is that a reasonable understanding? Oh, that's absolutely part of it. Uh, uh, Mother Spirit teaches that God's, one of God's essence is a thing of sharing. In other words, if it wasn't for God's desire to share, there wouldn't be any universe. There wouldn't be any creation at all. And his whole idea is that he lives through us. Uh, he's actually a part of us. He, he also has a presence within us that almost every religion acknowledges this small, still voice within us. And Mother Spirit teaches that in a sense, we are this extension of his experience. He experiences the whole universe through all of his children, you know, trillions, trillions and trillions of, of all kinds of beings. This is, in a sense, what he wants to do. Is And also, he, he shares his creativity with us because we are actually spiritual beings who are kind of co-creating our own reality. So as we have our own subjective inner reality and in relationship to everything, we share that with him right inside of us. Now, Urantia is the name for our planet, planet Earth. Yes. And we are part of a, uh, a universe and a, a system of uh, planets that is under the aegis of the Christ Michael figure. Um, and Mother Spirit, right? And Mother Spirit. And it really, uh, the, the, the creation of this universe really was a collaborative effort of the male and female spirits coming together. Uh, yes, yes, so it's the, uh, they're getting away from the old notion, uh, the old pantheistic notion that God personally does everything. God actually creates, you might say, subordinate creative beings like Michael and Mother Spirit who actually out here in time and space, actually create life, actually uh, organize uh, things. So the universe is actually created and then administered by subordinate beings like Christ Michael and Mother Spirit. Makes sense. Right. And the quality, uh, tell us about the, the divine spark within mankind it it kind of emerged at some stage do you have a sense of how that happened was it just natural evolution or was it kind of guided intention 
Well, it's very intentional because uh, Mother Spirit teaches we actually have three great spiritual influences right within us. We have her presence. Uh, we also have Christ Michael. Remember Jesus as uh, he mentioned to all of his followers that his spirit of truth would come to live within us. So we have his spirit of truth within us. We also have a presence of God within us. But it's the very essence of spirit to let their children, us, <laughs> to let us alone in one way. In other words, we actually have to ask for help. They're not intrusive at all in our life. They're there. They're actually augmenting and helping us you know, expand our lives. But they're not at all intrusive. And so they say this is the essence of being a good parent. Is you're there to back up your children, but you let them have their own life. You're not intruding and making them live for you. And there is, we actually have, this is how we actually have our own life, our own independent personality, because these great spiritual beings actually let us be. Well, if they didn't let us be, as you mentioned at the beginning, it would be very boring because, you know, if you are omniscient and you have everything pre-programmed, then there's no growth. Well, there's no they, surprise in it. Well, they also teach that there is no, uh, their omniscience does not extend, in other words, to all these beings they give a, a, a relative degree of freedom. The very fact that we're free, the future has not happened yet, even for God. Because in other words, God actually lets us be, lets a whole universe of personal beings, gives them their freedom he, could, uh, he, has, he sets up certain par parameters for us. We can't fly like birds, so we have to invent airplanes. But to a large degree, the future has not happened yet. The future is actually open for all of us because we are also, God shares his creativity with us. And so to a large degree, we are creating, co-creating, you might say, our own future. That's the extent of our freedom if we only, <laughs> if we only realize it. What happened uh, on the timeline in the 1980s? Uh, well, it's going back. A, for, we've been under a, kind of a spiritual quarantine for uh, several hundred thousand years. Our planet went into default. Uh, the, there actually was a thing called a Lucifer Rebellion. Mm -hmm. And a certain amount of planets enjoying this rebellion. And ours was one of them. It's one of the reasons why Michael chose to have his life as Jesus on this planet to help turn things around. And so in, in the 1980s, this quarantine was lifted. Uh, and our planet now is being, re you might say, reinstituted within all the, uh, the celestial circuits and things. And this is why right now people can actually tune into spiritual beings or spiritual part of themselves. It's like Donna used to tease me that anybody can transmit <laughs> Michael or Mother Spirit if they just have the training. If they just sit down in their meditation and say, okay, Mother Spirit, I'm open. What have you got for me? And start taking notes. It's, it's, that, it's that direct. And a lot of people are doing that, in fact. Uh, certainly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> from the stacks of books uh, surrounding me. And... I wonder what was the uh, thing that gave you confidence that you were, in fact, channeling these entities? Why uh, was it just because it sounded very much like what your mentor was doing? Because I know a lot of people, when they're developing their intuitive gifts, um, have this worry that it's their imagination they're making it up what gave you the confidence i think mary this is by the way this is where uh you put your finger right on it this is the very first thing that occurred to me is how do i know this isn't just what i think it should be uh the only thing i can i can assure your listeners is that i myself know for myself i can't be so positive that's the most remarkable thing about michael and mother spirit from their standpoint, from their from from their viewpoint, from their point of view, I can't begin to create that. Especially when I have like five or six people sitting around me, it's not like I'm hearing a voice in my mind and then repeating it. It's too instantaneous for that, mm -hmm. and it's entering a space where 
the difficulty of transmitting is you have to be comfortable with not with with not knowing what's coming next because it's not coming from your own personality, like my conversation with you now. And also at the end of these transmissions, I have very little rem- memory of what they were. So fortunately, I, I record them, and then I have help transmitting them. So, <clears throat> excuse me, transcribing them. So you can actually read all these things if you go to that TM archives. So it's something that uh, it's un- unmistakable once you do it is that you have something coming through you. You cannot anticipate it. Mm -hmm. If you even start to anticipate it, it just stops. And when you actually read the books, uh, one is really impressed with the depth of wisdom and the the feeling that really comes through that you resonate with. So, Jerry, what is next for you? Well, like I say, I uh, uh, continue uh, doing this work uh, once a uh, once a month, I have a uh, a light line teleconference. And what's the website where people can join that or listen to it? No, it's it's a uh, teleconference. It's a uh, 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 you call a number. Yeah, but they have to con- they have to find out where it is. So. Oh yeah, well my my excuse me yes thank you for mentioning. Uh, my website is called evolvingsouls dot org. Is it evolving hyphen souls or just evolving souls? Evolving, actually a little dash, evolving-souls.org. And once they go there, they can, uh, all this information is there, especially for this light line teleconference I do once a month. And then I have a group that meets here. We're, we're taking off for the summer, but I have a group here that meets in my home. And this is where uh, several hundred of these transmissions, what you call channeling, uh, that's where you'll find them on TM Archive. Well, that's amazing. Well, thank you very much, Jerry, for being with us today. We've been speaking with Jerry Lane about the adventure of being human, book two, Mother Spirit Speak. So check out his website, evolvings-souls.org. And I want you to stay with us because we're going to be back shortly with our next guest. Your conscious connection to a more mindful world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. If you've ever said I do, I do want it all. I do want happiness. I do want love. And I do desire the happily ever after fairy tale life. Then this show is for you. Join me, Dean Nicole Brandon, for my internationally acclaimed show, Bridal Talk Radio, every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, where I'll bring you the top experts in the fields of communication, money, relationships, finance, pleasure, play, travel, sexuality, parenting, real estate, adventure, comfort, care, passion, and love. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. The truth is, you can't change the world if you're broke. I know, I tried. Isn't it time you turned your life's calling into a profitable, freedom-based business? I'm Michelle Barr. Join me every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern for Sacred Success. Connecting you with the best of the conscious minds in the world. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. We are back 
My guest now is Bennett Cobb. Ben is the author of the Guru Free Guide to Nada Yoga, Sound Current Meditation for the Rest of Us, published as an ebook just this year. Ben is a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and a member of the International Remote Viewing Association and the Society for Scientific Exploration. He has a long-time interest in scientific anomalies and Eastern self-cultivation practices. His previous book, Wireless Spectrum Finder, is a compendium of radio technologies and frequencies. Now, his latest book is about a different frequency, one that resounds in every human consciousness. Meditation on inner sound is practiced by millions of people, but it remains largely unknown in the West. Ben's new book peels away the curtain on this yogic technique. Welcome, Ben. I am so delighted you could join us. I'm happy to be here. Miriam, are we communicating okay? We are fine. I'm delighted now, to uh, learn about uh, Om Times Radio and New Consciousness Review. Well, thank you. Now, we know what the word yoga refers to, union or connecting, and most of us are familiar with hatha yoga. But what is nada yoga, or it's also called shabd yoga? Yes, that's right. Um, this is uh, one of the recognized techniques of yoga, but it's not well known in the West, uh, despite the fact that it's practiced by millions of people. Uh, nada is a Sanskrit word that refers to flow, and shabd or shabad or shabda refers to a uh, word or speech or sound. So we have a flow of sound or sound current, which is what this type of meditation is usually called in English, sound current meditation, and it's also called uh, audible life stream. So what attracted you to this form of yoga? Well, uh, I learned this many years ago in, uh, in Texas when I was a college student, and I met up with a number of people who practiced this method. But what was interesting, for one thing, is that they were all from different groups or different disciplines, different philosophies attached to it, but the same method. And the other thing is that it was rather secretive. Although a lot of books had been written about it, poetry, this type of meditation appears in ancient writings of yoga, there really wasn't any easy way to find out exactly what do you do. <laughs> and uh, now many years later, uh, it occurred to me <laughs> that that is still the case and there, uh, there are some more books. There are a few things that will tell you how to do it. Uh, there's a lovely recent book, many hundreds of pages. You've got to go through 20-plus chapters before you get to the instructions. And I was determined to write something that was mercifully short. <laughs> Spoken like a true engineer. So the, the tagline to your book is called The Guru Free Guide. And uh, why why guru free? And and also you have the phrase for the rest of us, the sound meditation for the rest of us. What do you mean by that? Um, almost without exception, all of the groups that teach sound current meditation almost spend more time focusing on the master than on the meditation. Uh, there's much more emphasis in a total surrender to the group uh, and to the master, uh, imagining the master, listening to the master, focusing on the guru. Mm -hmm. Guru or healer, uh, you'll be exempt somehow from suffering or confusion. And, and I'm quick to say that that is not the approach of this book. This is a natural uh, form of energy. It's a natural form of connection. And you do not need a perfect master, uh, wise, however he or she may be. They're usually men. Uh, and, and it is not absolutely necessary to get involved in a, a highly controlling uh, 
a cult or a group in order to expose this uh, to yourself. And as far as the rest of us, um, again, the idea is simplicity, uh, get to the point and um, uh, learn about it, give it a try, see if it's a worthwhile tool for you without necessarily having to change diet or change beliefs or make a lengthy commitment. What did you find that this form of yoga does for you and, and uh, what will people find in it? Um, I'm continually amazed by and humbled uh, having found this. Uh, and, and there's the hardest part to talk about, which is spiritual connection. It's one thing to theorize that we're something more than material uh, ingredients walking around. But it's another thing to feel and experience it. So for me, um, the key to it is this um, refreshment, renewal, uh, spiritual connection that can be renewed. That's the number one thing that I get out of it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it did improve my grades <laughs> when I was a <laughs> when I was a college student. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the very first times I did this meditation, I, I meditated for a while, and then I had to pick up a a, a book, a textbook for my co one of my college mm -hmm. classes. This book was absolutely boring. It happened to be a history book. I found it extremely dull, and yet I had to get in a chapter, study a chapter. Uh, before class the next day. Uh, and the only thing that was different was I meditated using this new method and then sat down to try to try to get through this chapter. And this chapter was fascinating. The book was amazing. I felt the knowledge just kind of being vacuumed up into my mind. I'm turning page after page and really enjoying it. But it was the same book. Mm. <laughs> Nothing had changed about the the old boring book, it wasn't boring anymore. It was something had changed in myself. There's a kind of a, a light that goes on or an energy that one takes on, and that can help in comprehension. It can help um, a person be more the person they want to be, and this is what, what I have found in, in addition to the, the different experiences and effects that are outlined in the book. Um, having read the book, I was amused uh, that first upon understanding that you listen to the sounds in your head, you block your ears and listen intently to the sounds inside your head. I was thinking, well, this sounds like tinnitus, which I have anyway. And then mm -hmm. your next chapter was, no, this is not tinnitus. <laughs> so t tell us a little, describe it. How does it work? Uh, well, the, well, the technique of sound current meditation uh, does begin with um, and, and is essentially uh, very close attention and close uh, absorption in uh, inner sound, a specific inner sound, uh, which is what people start with. And most people have had experience of, of a tone, an inner tone, usually on the right side of the head, right, the right ear, perhaps. And this tone can uh, lead to additional sounds and additional experiences. And uh, it's, it's always seemed funny to me that in all the ancient writings about this and the, and the newer writings by the many, many gurus who teach this, they never talk about tinnitus, mm -hmm. also called tinnitus. And so uh, there, is, there is one book uh, written by a, a guru who teaches this who is also a medical doctor. And uh, he basically says the medical profession has this thing all wrong. He calls the sound current a long-distance call to your greater being. Now, this is not to uh, play down the fact that some people have an annoying and disabling uh, condition of, uh, of tinnitus uh, that they try to get medical uh, treatment for. And perhaps this is not the meditation for them, although I have also heard that some people who do have medically diagnosed tinnitus have actually um, found it, recovered from it by practicing the methods of sound current meditation. 
So just to, to finish on that, um, medical science still does not really understand what the source of the sound is. Uh, it, they, for a while, they thought it was malfunctioning cells in the hearing mechanism. However, it's been shown again and again that people with normal hearing – a large percentage of the population with normal hearing can hear this interior tone. And so um, I think that it's partly physical, partly physiological, and partly more than physical, just like human consciousness is partly physical. It's part of the body and the brain. But those of us who um, are in the new consciousness field – know that consciousness is much more than the physical and that we might even be able to get along without the physical one day but still remain conscious. So listening to the sound current develops spiritual connection, um, very tangible experiences of energy flow, especially in the spine, in the energy channels in the spine. It can have a powerful effect, positive effect on dreams uh, as well as lead to um, extraordinary experiences like celestial music, transcendental music, and out-of-body experiences. And it is so easy to do. Tell me, Ben, what is your website? The website for the book is www.soundcurrent.info. That's one word, soundcurrent.info. And the book is available uh, through Amazon and Apple iBooks and the other sources. It is an ebook, and again, it's called The Guru Free Guide to Nada Yoga, a Sound Current Meditation for the Rest of Us by Bennett Z. Cobb. Ben, I'm so glad you could be with us today, and I really enjoyed your book, and I recommend it to our listeners. So thank you, Ben. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope you will stay with us for our last guest. Uh, we will be right back after these messages. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Live with Medium Lisa Phoenix. Mediumship messages and musings. Explores mediumship and all things metaphysical. Lisa Phoenix invites you to reach above and beyond your everyday experiences. To explore new dimensions in the spirit world. She will do live readings to connect callers to their loved ones in spirit shares engaging stories and teachings from her own personal experience, and will have intriguing conversations with other mediums, spiritual teachers, and healers to help you understand the metaphysical world so you can connect to these forces in your day-to-day -day life. Join your host on this magical and metaphysical journey into the world of spirit every Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Simone Millicis would like you to know that business can be fun, which is why she wrote the book, Joy of Business. What if you could have the joy of business rather than the stress and struggle? Most of the time, the only thing stopping you from a thriving business is you. In the Joy of Business book, Simone gives you access consciousness tools and pragmatic ways to get out of your own way and to create the business, life, and living you know is possible and beyond what this reality says is achievable. Business is joy. It's creation. It's generative. It can be the adventure of living. You can purchase your copy of the book through Amazon or Joy of Business website, www.accessjoyofbusiness.com. Eros Evolution is where sexuality and spirituality meets. Join me, clinical sexologist Martha Tara Lee, on Eros Evolution on Thursdays, 4 p.m. Eastern, 
on Om Times Radio. Free your mind, expand your soul. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Back with our final guest today, Margaret Grunstein. Now, Margaret was raised in Detroit. Then she headed east for education and then west to follow the great radical migration of the 1970s. Her career ranged from city planning to photography, ultimately creating a niche for herself as a single parent and the owner-director of a preschool in Venice, California. Margaret also has a private practice as a psychotherapist, and she has just published her first book, a memoir called Naked in the Woods, My Unexpected Years in a Hippie Commune. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Now, Margaret... Uh, those those were interesting years, and you went to the woods to escape some of the patriarchal expectations imposed by society. Did any of these problems follow you into the communal life that you created together? You know, um, that's a good question. It's it's one of the points of the book. Um, when I when the phraseology and the rhetoric of the age comes, it sounds so um, almost silly. But we really went with open hearts, or at least I did, believing that it was that change was necessary and that we would live it if we couldn't change outside the world outside. But we're human. We bring our human qualities with us. And although it was a glorious time for me and a wonderful experiment, um, certainly you know we went back to the woods. We all of a sudden, uh, ultimately, we were a land that had no running water, no electricity, no utility whatsoever, um, and male skills were needed. So here we were, new feminists, the women, and we found ourselves, um, you know, <laughs> in you know, nineteenth century, mid nineteenth century technology, where we were dependent on men to chop down the trees or yield, you know, wield some of the heavy equipment. And um, yes, and and money followed us. Many, many, all the issues of larger society followed us, and we struggled sometimes successfully, and sometimes not to to you know as we wrestled with them well you came to the woods of oregon god bless oregon um and you were creating this little utopia did you actually find what you were hoping for you know, I don't think I found what I was hoping for, but I found um, something just as good and probably more realistic. I went with, you know, I was young there. The times were just a spectacularly specific point in American history. Um, and so this is also a historic document, one woman's story. Um, and I kind of followed my husband. I wasn't quite sure um, what we were going to do. And there were many steps to the process. Um, we were a very loosely organized commune. If you, you know that there were a lot of artists and architects and a lot of egos, no one was going to listen to one dominant voice. So we weren't followers of a guru or anything like that. I found the glory of stepping away from a highly um, focused achie- life of achievement. Not that it isn't internal to me and that I haven't come back to it, but there was. I came back to it voluntarily. Um, I found being in the woods and uh, and the and Oregon, the coastal Oregon and the mountains and the farmlands there are spectacular. So to live daily on a, uh, that basis with that beauty in my life, I found um, discovering gardening, living intimately with other people, and the and the joy of that. Um, so there were many things I looked for that I got, but not necessarily in ways I expected, and that they follow through with me um, to this day and inform what I do now. Do you think this was just a moment in time coming after the 60s and the sort of love revolution? Do you think it has any resonance today? Oh, yes. Well, first, everything comes out of the past and feeds the future. I read books, Helen and Scott Nearing, who in the 40s and 50s had their own little communal situation in the in the Northeast on the land. Um, I look, both my daughters live in Portland. I, you know, I visit Detroit. I visit other cities. I talk to people. Everywhere you see, there's the food revolution, you know, um, organically grown, locally grown, non-genetically um, modified foods, um, little gardens and backyards. My preschool has a garden. Um, I see desires for community. I see desires for um, whether, and, and, and there's that longing for community is universal and that longing to be part of something bigger than ourselves where we feel we're connected to some larger good. 
Um, I think it may vary somewhat for every generation, but there's a classic history of utopian thought, and it's almost always rural. Um, and it's you know, how can we get together in harmony and, and combined with a sense of love for our fellow man and each other. It's a little harder to find than it is to <laughs> seek, i got to say. But isn't that the purpose of life? <laughs> <laughs> now, is there anything that you regret about the experience? And do you, do you think overall it was successful? You know, there are almost two separate questions. I was at a reading and someone said, well, it sounds like it wasn't working and that you really didn't like it. I, those were five fabulous years in my life. Who can say that they followed their dream, their best and most extravagant dream to its end? Um, and when later when I had children and I was a single parent and my nose was really to the grindstone, I, that was kind of money in the emotional bank for me. There's no resentment that I didn't have a chance to do some of the exotic or exciting or adventurous things I wanted to do. You know, that there's other groups up there that are still alive, you know, that functioning. There's other loose connections of people that were in smaller groups that still function in different ways, a little more realistically. Um, so we've, we're all still connected in some way or other and carry that history with us. And we carried, it was successful in the sense that uh, we connected to a light that shines. And that light still shined in us and will shine in other people. Um, and it doesn't necessarily... Um, we can get something from a marriage even if the marriage doesn't work. Um, you know, we have moments in all relationships that are a bit funky, friendships, children, parents, but we can still, if we have the right attitude, take something from those and move forward into bettering ourselves and the world around us. Absolutely. So what was the organization of the group? How did you make decisions, for example? Ad hoc. You know, my husband was... Uh, <laughs> kind of like nice. <laughs> <laughs> and um you know my there were once we moved to the well, my husband had been it was a very strong personality and very charismatic and very uh philosophical in terms of political orientation and so he was a great mover and shaker and once we moved to the land where it really depended on how you could fix your car or build your building because there was no structure except a shack um that Clint who um was an architect and a, and a builder and a big strong man. So my husband was smaller in physique. The two of them became sort of the the two, to, you know, one more philosophical, one more practical. Um, but ideas could be put out. One day my husband put out money on the table. Unbeknownst to me, it was our last money that we had just picked up from a um, tax return. Slammed it on the table at our communal dinner and said, this is all we've got. You know, I think we need to share our money. Who else is ready to put money up? You know, and that was the discussion. At the table, some people said, well, I don't have anything to put in. I'm broke. Someone else said, I'll put in a little, but I'm saving money out for me. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait, aren't we married? That was my money, too. What happened? <laughs> and somehow we muddled through that um, people would put money in. We'd Someone would say we need something. Someone would help somebody else on a project. Again, very unstructured. Mm -hmm. um, but with a great deal of generosity, but also battles, you know, internal and communally as to what is a mine and what's yours. Do you think we can ever find utopia? I think we only find it inside ourselves, and we find it in moments in life, and we find it if we're inclined to look for it and want to appreciate what's given to us on a day-by-day -day basis. I have a fabulous life. Um, you know, there have been magnificent moments and down moments as well in my life. Um, I had those, were, that was a great place. It was no different than the rest of life. We're humans, we have feet of clay. And so I think it's what we choose to do with our lives and the attitude and the work we do inside ourselves. Mm. So looking back, would you have done it all over again? Oh, in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't regret the life I have now. Um, but I think that that was a wonderful, I'm thrilled that I jumped all the way in, didn't hold back, didn't keep a day job, left everything behind and did it full bore. And it was just a wonderful adventure that was fun, opened me up, expanded me past boundaries that had been created and I had created for myself. Um, and it, it was just wonderful. So... You chose the title Naked in the Woods. I take it thereby hangs a tail? Um, yes and no. You know, it's a little, um, you know, uh, catching the most exotic. I think part of it speaks to the fact that we were, you know, 
the vulnerability, the openness, um, the openness of the book, um, uh, the willingness to look at it not just from a dogmatic point of view, um, and, and how we were naked to each other, and not just physically as we swam or took a sweat bath, but um, as we lived with each other. When, it, when you live together, even if you're not intimately involved physically, sexually, you get to know each other. You get to know each other's ups and downs. Um, and how we work together and where we forgive each other and where we don't. So truly, our essences were naked to each other, um, and we saw each other reflected back. Lovely. Margaret, what's your website? It's margaretgrunstein.com. So my name, M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T, Grunstein, G-R-U-N-D-S-T-E-I-N.com. Margaret Grunstein, and her book is Naked in the Woods, My Unexpected Years in a Hippie Commune. Thank you so much for being with us, Margaret. Thank you so much. It was a delight. And I hope you'll join us next week. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, In the meantime, visit New Consciousness Review on ncreview.com, where you can subscribe to our free content-packed multimedia magazine and explore our whole podcast archive. You can contact me through the website, again, ncreview.com. Hope you'll join us next week to meet more rising stars of the new consciousness. Until then, shine brightly, dear friends. The world needs your light.